for those of you who don't know me, it's Noreen Tomasi, and I'm the director here of the Center for Fiction, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this event and to thank Rue Freeman especially for her great um, foresight in, in creating this project and then for her great kindness in thinking of the Center for Fiction as a possible venue for it. Um, it's a cause that is um, dear to my heart in that, um, as I said earlier this week on our website, um, like probably everyone in this room, I abhor violence of any kind in any country, and I especially abhor it when innocent people are caught in the crossfire as they were um, so terribly in Gaza Strip, how they, how they have been in Jerusalem, how they have been in other parts of the world, how they have been in Tel Aviv, along the border to our group, all these places. Um, innocent people have died for what I think is nothing really and an insoluble problem. Um, I first um, became truly aware of this problem a long time ago, much older than everyone in the room. In 1990, I was um, organizing a conference at the time of the Venice Biennale um, in Venice at the Fondazione Chimini. Um, the nature of that conference was expanding internationalism. And two things happened to me personally there. One, I had the great pleasure of learning about Alfred Arteaga, the Chicano poet scholar, and um, this phrase, which uh, became embedded in my mind. Um, Fiction making can become an ally of history. So I wanted you to think about that and what that means. And also, Beatrice Spivak was a speaker at that conference, and she spoke about the connection between fiction and what she calls imaginative responsibility. And so I was very impressed by that connection. And one of the things we've done this year is to commission a series of essays called Why Fiction Matters um, on the topic of fiction as an important voice in um, the world as we deal with so many injustices. Um, the other thing that happened to me that year and in the following year was first, I was on a vaporetto and I met a young woman with her infant daughter, um, Israeli curator, and she was crying on the vaporetto. And she turned to me and asked me if there was a way as an American I could help get her into America so she didn't have to return with her small child to Israel because she was afraid and she decided that when it was only her life she had to worry about, she didn't care. But now that it was her child's life, she did care. And I'll never forget the look of her eyes. But then, I spent a lot of time traveling in the region, and that look in her eyes was in so many eyes of Palestinians, of the Bedouin family I met, of Lebanese people. I saw it in Beirut. I saw it in Jerusalem. I saw it everywhere I went across those borders. People just desperately afraid um, every moment of their lives. And um, so that's why I was so eager to host this event. Um, and I am not going to say any more <laughs> except to applaud the authors here for a couple things. Um, contributing to this anthology, but also, um, you should know that these authors have donated their fees to the Palestinian Festival of Literature. Oh. And that Rue has very generously donated a portion of the proceeds of the book sales, and I think that's probably her portion, <laughs> um, um, to the Festival of Palestinian Literature. But we all know Rue's like that, right? Thank you. <laughs> um, so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the writers. They'll be up here one at, one at a time to talk. But first, I'd like you to hear a little bit from the editor of this wonderful anthology, Rue Freeman. So we're not actually going to introduce each writer. Um, as knowing promise, because you have these pieces of paper on your seats and they'll tell you all the glowing things that you need to know about them, apart from the most glowing facts of all that are all here. 
Um, so, uh, good evening and welcome for being here. Um, I want to thank you, Noreen and Kristen, um, John, and um, everybody at the Center of Fiction for allowing us to use this beautiful space, uh, this beautiful and historical space, which was actually created in 1920, I believe, to. Uh, 1820. 1820. I'm sorry, I'm not going to say war. But uh, math was never my strong point. Uh, that was created to uh, generate national conversations based on exposure to literature. Uh, it seems like a fitting place to uh, highlight the work of this quite dazzling array of writers who are gathered here. Um, someone said at, the, at, at an event we had uh, a while ago, a few weeks ago, when we were all gathered together to take a photograph, uh, what is there to smile about? And uh, they meant, what was there to smile about? Because we were gathered to speak about Palestine. And I've had the good fortune to travel a little bit in my life. And I found that um, some of the warmest, um, wittiest, and most joyful people I'd ever met, I met in Palestine. And I was reminded of the, uh, what I was told in Naida refugee camp by someone who was there. Uh, he, he said, you don't have to cry for us. If you want to help, go back and do what it is you can do. And this book is that can do for me. And so I want to thank Colin Robinson, who's here from our books, for embracing this project so willingly without ever having met me. Uh, but he just believed all the things I promised I could do. Um, thank you for that. And um, also, the 65 writers who are in this book, as well as all the writers whose work was submitted but didn't make it into the book. Um, 65 is a pretty uh, wonderful number. You've all heard the song, uh, the Al Guthrie song, Alice's Restaurant. If you have one person talking about something, or some people have, so not everybody, you need to go back and listen to it. Um, if you have one person talking about something, you're considered crazy. If you have two people talking some about something, you might be arrested. If you have 50 people talking about it, my God, you have a movement. So 65, is, uh, it's hard to dismiss number. It's hard to say of these writers, they're only uh, lefty, Loonies, although I confess to being part of an August Gap group, um, uh, or only black, only white, only East Coast liberals, only West Coast tree huggers, uh, only the non Jewish, or only the people who have never been to Palestine, or only those who have. Um, there is no ideological umbrella under which you can put all these writers. If there's something that unites them, it is that they wanted to ameliorate the rift that exists between national policy and personal moral culpability. That to inhabit that one-on-one, -on -one, that is at the heart of compassion. What I asked of these writers is that um, they exhibit a parody of conscience. In a time when we can talk about any oppression, any tyranny, any war, any life, any death, any terror, anywhere in the world, with none of fuscatory language. It seems only right that we are able to do the same when we talk about Palestine. And parity of conscience is not um, parity of suffering or struggle or circumstance. Uh, Tamar Rice, 12 years old, who died in Cleveland, Ohio, and Ahmed Sharaka, who uh, died in Ramallah, Palestine, 13 years old, were both murdered. And though the circumstances of their murders, their suffering and their struggle is different. If our conscience was moved by those deaths, then it seems only right that we should speak of that in the language to which we have the privilege to have access. And um, to give each of those lives dignity and worth, equal worth, the way that Cathal does in um, Carl McCann's prose, which opens this uh, collection of writing. Um, it, it, you know, people have talked about the for and against aspect of things. If there's a for in this book, it is a for humanity, because I believe that what is implicit in the writing of all of these uh, writers in this book is the belief that violence deforms and mutilates the violent as much, albeit with less immediate fatality, as the violated. Um, so, uh, lastly, I would like to say that we do not speak for Palestine or Palestinians. 
but then we speak toward Palestine. That with each event that we have, it becomes normal to say the word Palestine. That with each event we have, it becomes easier to dismantle the narrative that has taken hold suddenly in this country, and as pointed out by Jason Scheidemann in his face, uh, this narrative of a land without a people. And with each event that we host, it becomes extraordinarily ordinary to have a bunch of writers gathering together to speak about Palestine, as ordinary as it would be to speak about Russia, or France, or Cuba, or Guatemala, or the United States. <clears throat> so this book is a gift of recognition as well, a way of saying to people in Palestine, we see you. So I would ask you to sit back, relax, and let yourselves be moved by the eloquence of these writers. <clears throat> Thank you. Here. The old port of Jaffa is here. The sunlight pours on my memories here. The old stone houses with tiles, tiles, tiles here. Evidence of homes buried in different names here. The years we never defined here. The echoes we collected in each other here. The shivering breeze against our skin, the dark paradise under our eyes here. But you were not here, and I was not here, they say. But we were here. We are here. We are here. And I'm going to read just a very short excerpt from a piece that was uh, published today called uh, entitled Crucifixion that was published in Electric uh, Literature, which very generously um, advertised this evening. Uh, it's about Bethlehem, and we're in December. And as we, many of us will celebrate uh, Christmas and other uh, holidays, the natives in the birthplace of Jesus don't have that same luxury. It's now December. Every year, Christians worldwide celebrate Christmas. Some will come to Bethlehem. They will be told not to buy anything in the birthplace of Jesus because the natives are dangerous and untrustworthy, even best to leave their wallets altogether. They will pray while the natives apply for permits to enter religious sites. Few visitors will discover what UN OCHA reports, that more than 85% of Bethlehem is designated to Area C, the vast majority of which is off limits for Palestinian development. That Bethlehem, along with Beit Jalla and Beit Sahur, are surrounded on three sides by the segregation wall. That over 100,000 Israeli settlers reside in 19 settlements and settlement outposts, including in those parts de facto annexed by Israel to the Jerusalem municipality. While they pray, the systematic and discriminatory policy of revoking the residency of Palestinians in Jerusalem will continue. While they pray, writers will warn, hearts will hurt, rivers will be ruins, words will be wounds. While they pray, love will ask the song of songs for love. While they pray, the daily painful execution will continue while they pray. Thank you all so much for coming out. It's a, um, it's a real honor to be here. Um, this time last week, I was actually in Tel Aviv. Um, I was also in Jerusalem, east and west. I was also in Nablus, and Bethlehem, and Nazareth, and all around uh, that extraordinary landscape of stories, and storytelling, and language. Um, I was privileged to meet all sorts of people, um, and the one thing that I can tell you that I felt from having talked to everybody from the right-wing rabbi um, and the uh, labor member of Knesset to the uh, Palestinian rap star to the 15-year-old in a uh, high school in, uh, in Nazareth 
is that um, it seems to me that everybody is calling for nuance. And one of the things that Rue has done uh, by um, allowing this anthology and allowing um, American writers to participate in this debate is that she has asked for us to embrace some form of nuance. Um, and I applaud you for it, Rue, and thank you for uh, bringing us together and to allow us to talk um, and to uh, share our stories with one another because in the end, what do we have but we have our stories. Death can take away a lot of things, but it cannot take away the stories that we have. Um, so I uh, was asked to participate and um, I didn't know what to, to uh, write, so I thought um, I would put in an old story that I'd written many, many years ago um, that centers around a Jewish myth about the Lamed Vatnik um, and uh, relates to uh, Palestine, a story called Cahill's Lake. And instead of reading the story itself, I'll read maybe just one paragraph from the end of it. Um, I'll just read you the explanation of why I, I, I wanted to uh, include this story. Um, I will say, very happily, that even though it's kind of shaky still, uh, the Irish peace process is now 17 years old. It was 700 years in the making, so <laughs> don't believe that it cannot happen. <laughs> and one of the great things was that, 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 that it came from here. You know, Senator George Mitchell uh, went across to, 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 to Northern Ireland and, and, and he listened to the Irish go on and on. And everybody knows the Irish go on and on and on. Mea culpa. Um, and he even got the nickname Iron Pants because he could sit in the seat for so long and listen to us you know, talk and talk and talk. But he allowed us our story. So that's what I would say to all of us and myself included. Uh, please allow everyone including the other, their story. I wrote this story, Calls Lake, 25 years ago. It's a young man's story, and there's a lot that I would change about it now, but I'm not here to tear myself asunder, nor to edit my own imagination. The story was written first off as a magic realist tale, in other words, a distinctly and overtly political one. All my South American heroes, Marquez, Galeano, were immediately political in their intent, but they were never overtly political. They preserved the mystery. They did not dictate meaning. I knew I wanted to write about Northern Ireland, where my mother comes from, and where I spent several of my summers. I had a gut instinct about what I wanted to say, though no idea how, about how I would say it, and the idea for digging swans out of the soil possibly resulted from a mi mixture of Irish mythology, the children of Lear, and contemporary poetry, Seamus Heaney's digging. Mm. I wanted to write about sadness and futility and the availability of a narrow bridge of hope through the overwhelming despair of the North. I also wanted to write about the Lamed Vatnik, or the Saddam, I don't know how to pronounce this, Nishtarim, a story that was immediately, I was immediately struck by when I heard about it in a Baptist church in Texas, of all places. <laughs> the Lamed Vatnik were the 36 righteous ones, or hidden saints, who carried the sorrows of the world on their shoulders. There is one saint, however, who has lost his line of communication with God, and so is cursed to bear his sorrows in silence. That is what attracted me, the silence, the curse, the loneliness. It was, of course, a Jewish myth, but it struck me that it was also, in essence, an Irish story. And as we know, there are at least two sides to every story. So, from the very outset, I felt I was writing a story that, because of the link with the Lamb of Vatniks, would also be a Palestinian story. This might sound odd, but there is as much Gaza as Derry in this story. It struck me that Cahill might very well be digging in the olive groves of another disputed territory. But hopefully the point of the story is that Cahill does not, in the end, fly a flag. He is cursed to dig. He must bear the sorrows and give them light. I recognize now that a writer's politics can be as dangerous to him or her as his or her own greed. The idea of writing an immediately political story can be very limiting. We can become so overtly conscious of our message that we can lose the mystery or the human element. It's far too easy to, to bring the disease of politics to our stories. Writers are not politicians, and they should not try to be. This is not to deny the ability to make statements, but the best statements come from within language and within rhythm and within mystery. 
I think most of us are tired of other people, i.e. politicians, telling us what to think. Certainly we're tired of writers telling us what to think. <laughs> what we love is being allowed to think. The best writing allows. It never proclaims. We make a mistake if we condescend to bear absolute meaning. What we need is the heart to one of the reasons why the peace process, now 17 years old, now worked in Northern Ireland, is that our writers did not, in general, dista take distinct sides. Writers of every stripe and background called for a cessation of violence. That's what mattered. They called for the sadness to be opened up and dissected, which eventually filtered into the political sphere. They recognized that the cessation of violence was an opportunity to open a space, not just in the political arena, but in the level of each individual's consciousness. This is where our stories matter. This is where we recognize that our stories have to be fixed, or that our fences have to be fixed. And so Carl's Lake is a short story. Um, it's about six pages long, in this, in, in, or six or eight pages long in this. I'm just going to read you the last paragraph. It's about a man who is, um, he's cursed. It's a magic realist story. He digs swans up out of the soil every time somebody in Northern Ireland gets, uh, gets killed. Carl lights his last cigarette and he thinks about how in two days the whole flock will leave and the digging may well have to begin all over again. Well, fuck it all anyway. Every man with his own peculiar curse. Cahill motions to his dog. He lifts his shovel and then leans home towards his farmhouse in his green boots. As he walks, splatters of mud leap up on the back of his anorak. Smoke blows away from it, him in spirals. He notices how the fence post in the far corner of the field is leaning a little drunkenly. That will have to be fixed, he thinks, as the rain spits down in flurries. Thank you. I bring a statement that places the poem I'll be reading moves back even further than that in the context in which it was written. Now, the statement is before the poem, an extraordinary rendition. I'd especially like to thank Ru, who brought extraordinary rendition into existence. I'd also like to thank all our books, uh, Colin, the publisher, for its commitment to publishing some of the most important writing of our time. And many thanks for the Center for Fiction for having us here this evening. Poem is in three parts. In the third part, the narrator is describing a conversation. The poem was written after the invasion of Iraq by the United States in 2003 and during the occupation that followed. News back even further than that. One. Dust. The dust of a dust storm. Yellow, black, brown, haze, smoke. A baby photographed with half a head. The stolen thoroughbred, a boy is riding bareback, attacked by a lion. The palace fixed up as a forward command post. This, says Air War Commander Mosley, would make a pretty nice casino. Why is such a detailed description necessary? The smell in the air is the smell of burned human flesh. Those low-flying 810 warthogs are, each of them, firing 100 bullets a second. Two, the president refuses to answer a question he wasn't asked. The president denies his eyes are the eyes of a lobster. A map is being drawn. Mosul in the north, Baghdad in the center, Basra in the south. The news back even further than that. He says he is the prophet Ezekiel, and the great mud flats by the river Shebar he has seen, he proclaims, four angels, each with six wings on a fiery wheel. Collaborators cut into pieces and burnt to death in public on spits like lambs and spray paint across the armored personnel carrier, crazy train, rebel, got oil, 
There on Sadun Street, in a wheelbarrow, a coil of wire, a carpet rolled Persian antique. Three, I've just been to see her. It's made her mad, angry, yes, of course, but I mean mad, truly mad. She spoke quietly, quickly, maniacally. War game. They're using war game as a verb. They didn't war game the chaos. Chaos. Do you think they care about the chaos? The chaos just makes it easier for them to get what they want. War game. What they war game is the oil. Their possession of the oil. What they war game is the killing, the destruction. What they war game is their greed. Had I noticed that Lebanon had become an abstract noun, as in the Lebanization of. It may just as well have been two or three atomic bombs, the amount of depleted uranium in the bombs, the bombs in this war, the bombs in the war before this. Uranium's in the groundwater now. Uranium is throughout the entire ecology by now. How many generations are going to be contaminated by it, die of it? poisoned by it. War, a wartime without limits. Techno-capital war, a part of our bodies, of the body politic. She quoted Pound, the peace and cantos. She couldn't remember which. There are no righteous wars. There are no, there is no righteous violence, she said. It's neurobiological with people like this people who need to destroy and who need to kill like this. And what we're seeing now is nothing compared to what we'll see in the future. Many years ago, when I was a student in Paris, I was required to take a French for foreign students course before the start of the term. The class was a veritable United Nations with representatives from Argentina, Poland, Greece, Germany, Iraq, and Iran, among other countries. I was the only American, and when the teacher taught us French slang, she laughed uproariously at my Boston accent. One day, our teacher asked us to pair up for an oral presentation. I was assigned the one Palestinian, a handsome guy with a beard. We went for a coffee to prepare our assignments, and he told me, I'm glad we're doing this together. We will talk about our people, the Palestinians and the Armenians, and their histories of dispossession and struggle. I looked at him blankly. I was a young American who knew little about my own people's tragic experiences in 1915, and far less about the travails of the Palestinian people. This poem is an homage to the extraordinary grace with which that young man whose name has sadly escaped me after all these years, met my terrible ignorance. Letter to Palestine with Armenian Proverbs. In a foreign place, the exile has no face. You wake up in the morning and forget where you are. The smell of coffee from the kitchen, the sound of slippers across the linoleum floor. It could be any country. When you look in the mirror, you see the eyes of your grandfather. He expects something from you, but he won't tell you what. Better to go into captivity with the whole village than to go to a wedding alone. The fabric was torn. With scraps, you have made a tent. You have fashioned a kite. You have sewn a dress. You have wrapped yourself in a flag. They have separated you with gun, grenade, barbed wire, wall, prison, passport. They have underestimated your will. The hungry dream of bread, the thirsty of water. Passing from one village to the next, without obstacle, without document, without your heart thumping up near your throat. Turning the key in the lock, you enter through a door you have never passed through before, except in your grandmother's stories and in your dreams. <laughs>